poetic lessons today are all based on the tongue, the power of the tongue. As we know, life and death are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. So if you speak life, you attract life. If you don't, you attract death or whatever negativity. So we got to be careful what we speak from day to day. So that's why we always do this. Now, I'm going to I'm going to start with the, the poem, the poem that uh, <coughs> it usually starts it all. Favor, favor of the Lord, favor ain't fair is the name of the first poem. Now, <coughs> a lot of you who are having problems at work, many of you who are having problems at work, it usually is because your favor or the light of the Lord or your anointing is bothering somebody. So when your anointing is bothering somebody, that is when they get jealous, they get upset, they don't even understand exactly what is all about. But because they don't understand the anointing, what is about her? She thinks she's just too good. She thinks he's this. Well, it's not that you think you're too good. If the, the light of the Lord is radiating from you and the light of the Lord is all, all, all over you and they don't have it, that can cause them to not like you just because of the light of the Lord. And you've heard me say this several times. So many times, that, that's why I say favor ain't fair. How come she got the promotion? How come How come that happened to them? How come people get jealous because people like you? People get jealous because people talk to you or people people just are talking about you behind your back and, give, and talking and praising your name. And people get jealous about that. So people don't understand favor. When the favor of the Lord is over you, things are easy for you and all those around you who see you getting that favor who don't understand the anointing, the favor of the Lord, they'll get upset just because you got favor. So that's why this poem is called Favor Ain't Fair, amen? People keep asking how I got my break. Who do I know? What decision did I make? There was no magic. I have one thing to share. When you're following God, favor ain't fair. Favor is his light shining bright on you. He makes you stand out no matter what you do. People all confused, pulling out their hair because they can't understand that favor ain't fair. I no longer question the favor of God when he gives me a blessing that others think odd. Some begin to act like they really don't care when it's driving them nuts that favor ain't fair. The favor of God is not in your control. He blesses you for doing what you are told. Just follow his word in all that you do and who, soon his favor will, be, will land on you. So let your light shine wherever you go. Your favor blesses others more than you know. Don't get caught up in the negative stares. It's not your fault that favor ain't fair. Amen. So now that's favor ain't fair. Now, because that's based on the scriptures because every poem has a scripture reference. Uh, Isaiah 58, 11, Psalm 5, 12, and Proverbs 3, 3 and 4. Amen. Now I'm, I'm seeing numbers dropping. Are you guys, uh, are you guys still hearing me okay or do I need to restart? Because uh, unfortunately, I don't, I don't get a warning anymore on my screen when the connection is bad. I don't get a warning like I used to to know that you guys are there. So you guys got that? You can hear that, Kazian? Uh, would you, you guys be a, uh, give me a, uh, let me know if you have any sound problems. Praise God. Praise God. I want to make sure because we've been having connection problems that I used to see on the screen. Now, favor ain't fair. That, and that's what the poem is about. We, so we don't worry about, we don't worry about what's wrong. Why, how come, how come, what am I doing wrong? I've had people ask me when they hate you at work and they're getting all twisted. What about, but what do I do wrong? I'm, I'm doing my work. I'm doing the best I can. I'm trying to turn in all the assignments. I'm doing everything the boss says, and nobody in the office seems to like you. Why? Because favor ain't fair. Amen. Favor ain't fair. That's what they don't understand. They can understand you just get. You might just walk into the job new, and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden people just don't just don't, just don't like you because you knew. No, it's not because you knew. It's because you anointed. <laughs> <laughs> they don't understand the anointing. Now, and the perfect example, I don't know if Liz A is on right now, but the prayer we were praying for her the other day, she had got a, we prayed for a job, she got a nice job, she loved the job, and just out of the blue, a, a lady who had the job she used to have, and now, uh, and now Liz, uh, 
in this A went into that position, this woman walks up and just confronts Liz A. She just, she just confronts her. And, and, and there's a big altercation, and then she, uh, Liz, she reports what happened. Well, long story short, if you guys remember the testimony, long story short, she gets fired because she's new, not because she started the altercation. The person who she replaced got so upset or jealous or whatever reason, we know this devil, devil jumped in the middle of that, caused the confrontation, and, and she's just doing her job. She didn't say anything offensive. The lady just physically confronted her and attacked her verbally, and it turned into an altercation. And now she's getting fired for coming in and doing her work. What? What's that all about? See, sometimes it's bigger than what we see. And that's why I want to let all of you know who are at work and you can't understand what are you doing wrong that the, the, the bosses or the coworkers don't like you. And you're doing everything right. You're trying to be, you're trying your best to be friendly. You're trying to make friends and talk to people and they just don't like you. And that usually is because the anointing. See, is what's happening is on the spiritual level. You're thinking, well, what are you doing wrong? On their level, in the spiritual realm, if they don't have the light, they don't have God, and, and, and they don't understand the favor of the Lord being on you, you don't have to worry about that. Because bottom line, we know that what? No weapon formed against us shall prosper, and every tongue that rises against us in judgment, we shall condemn. So even if they lie, when I, when I did that scripture, I broke down that scripture, any, any uh, tongue that rises against you, you shall condemn. The, that just means the word of God is backing us, that we shall condemn anything talked about us, any lie, any threat, anything somebody comes up just trying to stab us in the back. Praise God, we can come up and say, you know what? Hey, I did not do that. And I'm going to stand my ground. This is an outright lie, and I'm here to prove it. Amen. And God's got your back. That's right, because it's not about we wrestle not against flesh and blood. That's right. It's not about you in the flesh. It's what's going on in the spiritual realm. Remember, spiritual warfare is going on all day, all night, everywhere. So that's why we walk out of the house with Psalm 91 protection. Because wherever we go, wherever we go, spiritual warfare is taking place. So that's why we got to always keep our whole armor of God on everywhere we go. Walk out with Psalm 91 protection and remember who we are in Christ. That's why you hear me say it all the time. Pray without ceasing and everything give thanks. This is the will of God for you. You're not just praying for others. When you're about to walk into a job that's hostile, you pray before you walk into a hostile job. Or you got to have a meeting with somebody you know that's going to hit your last nerve. Pray. Don't walk into a, a, a meeting or a conversation with somebody you know who's going to hit your last nerve in minutes. That's somebody you need to pray before you talk to because they'll hit your last nerve so fast you'll jump back into the world and cuss them out. <laughs> just like a friend of mine, a friend of mine says, when, just before, a friend of mine says this, just before you're about to push his last nerve, he says, don't get it twisted. Just because, of, just because I got a robe on, don't think I don't have my street clothes on under this robe. Kind of let you know. You keep pushing. <coughs> Excuse me. He's trying to let you know, hey, you keep pushing. Now, I'm a Christian, but if you keep pushing, I'm about to jump out this robe. And I'm about, <laughs> I, I said, you know what? That's funny. And that's really what we all are. But we're trying to keep our robe on, amen? We're trying to keep our robe on. We don't want to throw our robe off, go hostile, knock him out, and then put the robe on. It's like, praise God. <laughs> we can't take the robe off, knock the person out, put the robe back on, and say, praise God. <laughs> no, no. <coughs> I can't laugh. I can't laugh. If I laugh, I start coughing. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. But I'm saying it's, it's a funny visual, but we're trying our best to keep our robe on so that we don't have to go there. You can say you can say funny things like, look, don't let me take you, don't let me take you to a place called there because you're about to go there and I'm about to move to a place called there and you're going to learn what there means. See, we can say all kinds of funny things like that to let them know that you're pushing my last nerve right now. You really pushing it. So I, I suggest you just back up. We just end this conversation because I just want to end it on a civil conversation and not say something I don't regret. Because remember, when you get pushed to that point and you talk longer than you have to, it usually becomes hurt for hurt. If somebody says something to hurt you, your response turns into, well, let me say something back to hurt you worse. Well, I will hurt you worse. And then all of a sudden, you said things you regret. And now you can say, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. Well, I'm, when you say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that, after it came out your mouth, 
it's hard to put the words back into your mouth because they heard it. And no matter how much you say, I really, I really didn't mean it. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry I said that. They're going to remember what you said for a lot longer than you said it because it hit them right between the eyes because whatever you said hit them to the very core of their heart because you said it to hurt them. Now, then you say, oh, man, I shouldn't have said that because I did that on purpose. Say, when you saying something to intentionally hurt somebody, that's being venomous. See, that's what the world is. The world is trying to steal our joy by being venomous, by saying things they know will hurt us, to talk about us. Words, remember that sticks and stones may break my bones and words will never hurt. I said, that's a lie. I changed, I changed it. I said, sticks and stones may break my bones and words can hurt forever. That's why I changed it too. Because so many people are adults now still going through hurt that words were spoken to them as kids. I mean, like I'm saying, when we, when we, if we hear bad and negative and hateful words as kids, we remember that because childhood is a part of it. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and if we don't, if we don't stop and gather that, gather ourselves together and get healing from what was said to us, then it's hard. It's hard. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I got my antibiotics to start yesterday. When you start, when, you sit, when it comes out your mouth and you don't take it back, so you don't want it to come out your mouth because that's why we say, think before you speak. How many of you ever heard that saying? How many times have you heard somebody say, think before you speak? Because if you speak on reflex, you're gonna automatically say something that you regret. Because now, if somebody hurts you, reflex, I'm gonna hurt you back. Somebody hurts you, I'm gonna hurt you back. Hurt me, hurt me, hurt me, hurt you. Hurt me, hurt you. You don't wanna be that. So so when you're about to say something, even if somebody says something to you that hurts you to the core, and all this stuff comes up in your mind that you know you can say that will rock their world, you you know you can say something back that can really break them into tears, but that's we're, we're not being venomous. We're not returning hurt for hurt. We're returning love for hurt. That's right, Deanne, tip tack can never win because Usually both of you are going to say something that you regret and now you're no longer friends or won't even talk to each other more because you just hurt each other the worst you can and that's healing that sometimes never takes place. Amen. Yes, think twice before you speak. Amen. And that leads to my next poem. Venomous intent. And we're talking about people who are saying things on purpose to hurt you. Venomous intent. They spread their venom to all they know. They lie for fun wherever they go. You know who they are, it's no surprise. I'm talking about people who tell nothing but lies. They care nothing about the damage that's done, for lying to them is nothing but fun. They don't even know the meaning of truth, for they've been lying since their youth. Lying one time only leads to more, cause hiding the truth is at the core. The master of lies has a heart of steel they give no thought about how you feel. A little white lie soon turns black. If you don't understand, it comes from lack. Lack of love, replaced by tension, soon turns to lies to get more attention. So liars take heed. God's on patrol. Don't liars say you have no control. But who's to say? Only time will tell. Will your judgment ticket be a ticket to hell? venomous intent. See, when you're lying to hurt people, the Bible talks about it. And that scripture is based on that. Uh, James 3, 4. James 3, 4 says what? Look at the ships also, though they're so great and are driven by strong winds, but are still directed by a very small rudder wherever the inclination of the pilot desires them. Verse 5. So also is the tongue, a small part of the body, yet it boasts of great things. See how a great force is set aflame by such a small fire, and the tongue is a fire, and the very word, the very world of iniquity, the tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body, and sets on fire the course of our life, and is set on fire by hell. See, the words we speak, that's verse six I just said, that's, and that's the, most, that's the most powerful part of what we're talking about. Let's, let's read verse 6 again. And the tongue is a fire, 
the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. See, when you start getting into the, getting into, into speaking the venom, don't think, and that's, and that's actually listening in Galatians and uh, Ephesians as the loose tongue or it, it, all, all types of speech that we shouldn't be talking like that. Uh, was it because don't wrestle with pigs <laughs> you get dirty and the pigs will enjoy it that's right when you drop to the level of others to speak venom back to them you just dropped out of the light of the lord to come into the world and talk to them at their level you just dropped from your level to talk back to them. that's what that means with the Kazian. don't wrestle with pigs because the pigs love being dirty you were up there being sparkling clean sparkling shining hey linda you're sparkling shining and then somebody brings you into the world and starts talking venom and next thing you're arguing and next thing both of you are cursing so they, they just brought you out of your love and light for the lord and they just yanked you back down into the world to their level we want to stay up on our level and bring them up if they don't want to come up to our level then they don't need to be talking to me see if they can't come up to your level and have a conversation intelligently and, and converse like human beings, we don't drop to their level and start, start talking venom and all the crazy talk. We keep our composure and keep it under control. Now that's hard to do because depending on your personality, if you're quick tempered, you gotta steal that, you gotta steal that like a like a, a hotline button. Because if somebody says something to you and you know you don't have a a slow temper, you got a quick temper, and somebody says something to you venomous, your reflect your reaction, like I said before, your knee jerk is to hit them back as hard as they hit you. But our godly side says, slow to anger, slow to anger, be slow to anger. When you're slow to anger, you don't come back in a reflex. They say something to you, and you go, should I say that? No, I better not say that. And then you come back and say something that's calming, that helps calm the fire you say something back equally as bad you're fueling the fire and in some cases the fire turns into a fight <laughs> amen so we've got to we got to teach we got to teach that uh daniel says well hey hey daniel houston uh houston texas the lord is teaching me and my wife to humble ourselves amen daniel see that's what it is I, with this one couple friend of mine, oh, oh wait a minute, I got straight money. I forgot to straight money. Oh, Sophia, I, I needed a second uh, knee shaft to remind me to shift my knee. <laughs> now, uh, Daniel, that's a perfect. Again, I want to share this with you and all of the, all of us who are married. This uh, uh, marriage couple friend of mine uh, at one church I was at years ago, they were the marriage counseling uh, uh, leaders of the marriage counseling fellowship, right? And they said that whenever they got into a disagreement, I won't say argument. Remember, a disagreement is a intense discussion, but it doesn't have to turn into an argument unless both people are not listening to each other. Usually it turns into an argument when people have to be right, they don't want to listen to each other's point of view, and if nobody's listening, it turns into an argument, it turns into shouting, then people slamming doors, throwing cups and saucers, dodging, walking out the door, slamming things, because nobody's listening. So this, this couple had a great thing that they did with each other. And I told them, you know, that, that's really great. When they sat down with a disagreement, they took a glass half full of water. And so, say you and me are arguing. Now, I'm making my point of view. Let me tell you, this, this is what's bothering me. So I'm talking, I got the glass in my hand. Now, you don't say a word until I put the glass down on the table, which means I'm done. Now you take the glass in your hand and you say back to me, whatever it is you feel about what I just said or your point of view about the disagreement. And I can't talk as long as the glass is in your hand because it means we're listening to each other. I said, you know what? That's ingenious because most disagreements, people are not listening to each other. They're so concentrated on being right that nobody wants to listen to each other's point of view. And that's why, that's why we've got to stop and talk. Talk means one person is talking, the other person is listening. If both of you are talking, that's not a conversation. That's a monologue. You're both talking to yourself because nobody's listening. You cannot heal 
if both people are not listening. So I, I encourage all of us who are married, if you're having trouble listening to each other, use the pass the glass technique. And, and, tell, and, and say that before you have a disagreement. Say this. What I want us to do uh, next time we have a disagreement, we're going to take a glass, and whoever has the glass in their hand it has the right to talk, and the other person has to listen until the glass is put on the table. And when the glass is put on the table, the other person picks up, starts talking, and the person who does not have the glass, they have to listen. And you can't say a word until they're done and the glass is on the table. And that keeps that keeps the discussion or the disagreement civil because every, and when I used to teach school, every fight started with both people talking and nobody listening. And next thing you know, both people are swinging and now you got to fight. And more, I said, it, it, the person's trying to tell you what happened. Uh, and in school, as you know, young people are fighting the drop of a hat. Somebody steps on their foot. Before the person can say, excuse me, the other person has knocked them out. Before they can say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't see your foot. It doesn't matter. They step on the foot, swing, bam. And use, and use a glass, yeah, any, any kind of glass. The whole point is, you can use, it doesn't even have to be a glass. Whatever you have in your hand, whoever's talking, has the power to talk. And whatever, you can, you can make it, they, they use the glass. But you can actually use whatever, whatever you have in your hand. Once that is put down on the table, whoever you're talking to, now you said your turn to talk and put it back up. Hey, Amen. Yeah, I, I don't. Uh, uh, Mario said you might be so mad when you talk, you might put the glass on the table and smash it. Because <laughs> sometimes this technique works. Hey, Amen, Marion. You know you can see somebody throwing the glass, and maybe you better keep. If you know you're temper, you know you got a temper. Keep the glass empty <laughs> because I'm third. <done>. Bam. <laughs> Don't laugh. Don't laugh. Don't laugh. Okay, don't laugh. Don't laugh. <sighs> See, you, you guys you guys being funny today. You guys cannot be funny because I start coughing. End of conversation. <laughs> so, but you guys you guys got jokes today, but that's funny. That's true. I mean, you got to, yeah, if you got a temper, use a plastic glass. And if you got a temper, don't put anything in the glass that will throw somebody's face. Because remember, the whole point of the exercise is control. Control the conversation. No matter, and, and no matter if it's a sensitive topic, and this does really help. This does really help a conversation. <laughs> Use a small egg timer. Oh, that, I like that. Well, you know, you know what? Now, and, and Kelly, I like the egg timer effect, but sometimes in, in, the, in the introduction of your, of your presentation, you might need to set that timer for 10 minutes because you got a lot to share. And I'm, so, so basically, whoever, you know, I like what you can say is if you use a timer, Whoever has the grief or the beef that needs to be discussed, you say that first, then you put the timer on because it might take you 15 minutes to say what's wrong with you. You know what, let me tell you something. Let me tell you this. Let me tell you, your head starts moving sideways. Let me tell you something. You know, ladies, you know, you know, ladies, when a lady's neck starts moving sideways, you might need 30 minutes. Because once she starts doing this, once, well, let me tell you something. Once her neck starts moving sideways, you might just not need to watch a TV show before she's done because till the neck stops moving, She's not gonna be done. Once the next stops moving, okay, good. Okay, then once this stops happening, okay, I'm done. You can use that too. Once my neck stops moving, you can talk. <laughs> Problem is, her neck may not stop moving. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, thank you. Let me keep it. But anyway, but you all understand what I'm saying. The oh, whole, you got a three-minute timer. Oh, Kelly, that's too short. That's too short, Kelly. That that's you got a serious subject. You cannot use a three-minute timer. It might take three minutes just to say the first half of what's bothering you. So that's why I said, if you use a timer, say your say what's bothering you first, then start the timer. But I, I suggest don't use a timer because with the more the more uh, emotional the disagreement is, you can't really be timed because if somebody's really hurting about something. And um, I mean, I had this guy years ago. It was a married couple. He got he got caught with infidelity. He caught the wife caught him uh, with another woman in one night stand. And, and it took them it took them almost gosh she, she forgave him, but it, it is now two years later, and he calls me and says he says well look I mean I I, I was in, I had infidelity in my life a, a few years ago, and I'm saying I'm sorry, but what's the big deal? Why can't she get over it? I said dude. Why can't she get over it? Infidelity, 
you been you lucky she's gonna get over it at all. Cause see, once once you bring infidelity into a marriage, trust you've destroyed trust. Trust is all a marriage has to keep it solid. Once you bring infidelity into marriage, you've just destroyed the term 100% trust because you may be forgiven. This this goes either way. If you've been caught with infidelity, the 100% trust level can never be reached again. It may get almost back to 99%, but there'll always be 1%. Will that person ever do that again? See, that's why that's why that's why infidelity ain't no joke cuz you work too hard in a marriage to develop trust. Trust the trust comes by a repetitive proof that you can trust me or whatever it is. Uh, and when, when Sister John first met me, uh, she, this is funny, I was an, an aerobics instructor, right? And so, so and, and just like our fellowship, 90% uh, uh, of the participants in the in the aerobics class were women, right? And so, and so, um, uh, Sister John came to watch the class one day, and one of the other ladies were uh, were sitting on the side with her. And she, that's your husband? You let him teach all these women? And she said, Well, I'm not worried about it. She said, Why not? How come? How come you're not worried about it? She says, I know he's coming home to me. <laughs> and now, now for her to say that. I know he's coming home to me. I ain't worried about what they what we's teaching. I know who he belongs to and where he's going after class. Now she couldn't say that boldly unless she truly trusted me that she didn't have to worry about me trying to have a relationship with somebody in class. See, that's what each one of us have to prove on both sides of the table. That okay, you meet an old friend, you an old friend that you used to go to school with. Now I can't say, well, how long you know him? Did he ever want to know you? See that? That's me introducing doubt into trust. And so, if, if if when you first get married, you should be exposing all the things about each other, so there are no surprises. If all of a sudden, well, you know, uh, this person that just called, uh, he was a long lost boyfriend, and uh, I I forgot to tell him I was married. What? <laughs> Give me my glass. <laughs> Time for the glass. <laughs> no, but see, but see, we can't introduce mistrust if trust exists see that's the th the, the biggest thing about marriage is well, here we go again we'll lean not to your own understanding if you've been talking things out and you're trying to keep trust built keep trust trust is built and reinforced 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 you'll just get trust and it just stays by itself trust is always reinforced by your actions each day each day you say you love each other. Each day you you prove and uh, you at work and a uh, and a pretty girl walks up and you're not saying well, uh, you know your wife is with you. You're going, well, what's her name? You're not gonna be saying what's her name and you're standing. Your wife is standing with you. I've seen guys do that. I said how how quicker can you destroy trust if you're standing with your wife? A pretty young girl walks by you and you watch the girl go by with your wife standing next to you. What's the first thing your wife's gonna say? What are you looking at? And why are you looking at it? You see, and now they get the glass. <laughs> get the glass. Confrontation coming. Danger, Will Robinson. <laughs> but see, I'm making a joke of it, but these are things that have to show how you keep trust reinforced. Daily, 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 you got to reinforce trust because the world is attacking marriage. Marriage is a godly covenant. The world and the devil going to be going, going to put lust put distractions, go put seduction, go put all kinds of things in your face to try to destroy a marriage because marriage is a godly covenant. So that's why you always hear me pray for marriages that are not even struggling because the devil's going to constantly throw in our faces anything he can to put a little, a little, a little glitch. Let me just get them to arguing. Let them, let me get them to mistrust each other. Let me, let me introduce some kind of conversation to get, get this trouble back. Let me get just something in their in their conversation that can get them arguing. But that's why we always say we just keep God at the center of everything in your marriage. We change over time. Whatever there's, when we keep God in the midst of our, our conversations, God in the midst, you got to keep God, both people holding on to God's unchanging hand. Because when you let go of God's hands, that's when you go into the world and start going back in time to the old man, old memories, and start saying things venomous, like we just said. You don't want to say things venomous. You're not, you're not trying to hurt. You're trying to heal. And if you get into an argument and you start turning it into a hurting contest, 
about who hurt who hurt you the worst you know well, you hurt me well you hurt me too well i hurt you well you hurt me next thing you know you separated or you divorced because you went into a hurting contest not a healing contest it's always got to be healing as a goal not hurting as a goal when healing is a goal you can heal but if you're hurting as a goal, you're going to be farther and farther apart. And this is not just for marriages. This is for friendships. This is for any kind of conversation that you're trying to heal. you got to be right there to try to bring it there. Uh, wherever I am right now, the connection is amazing. <laughs> well, I turned away from the sun, and I'm, I'm next to a big rose bush with a tree. Uh, I'll let you see. the. Uh, matter of fact, when I go out, the, the colors on this, this bush are phenomenal so i'm going when i close at the end i'm going to turn that way you know i don't know uh i'm going to try this if this you say the connection is perfect i'm in the exact same place i just turned the car a different direction but the sun is behind me so uh that that's it but yeah relationships are hard work and that's why we say marriage is work this is why you ask god for a mate amen wanda welcome wanda that's why we always say don't rush it like we were praying for the person uh liz was asking for the uh, other day the person who had a uh, her boyfriend was in prison, remember that? And uh, she, they want to get married to avoid fornication. I said, no, 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 you're not, you know, you're trying to avoid fornication. What about love and trust? Can you live together? Can you, can you, can you be together in one room long enough to not argue? I mean, that's work, that works. You can't rush into something unless you know the person that God has picked you. He knows who's best for you. When you pick somebody without God, usually you go, man, I wish I'd known that before. Well, if you waited on God, you would have known it before, but you rushed into it and you didn't give God time to show you there's something in this person you need to know, but you rushed into it. I don't need to know that. I don't need to know that, especially if you get sex involved, because when sex gets involved, sex blinds you of things you should know about because if sex is good. Oh, I, yeah, well, yeah, it's okay. It's okay. I can deal with that because sex is good. Wait a minute. Later on down the road, you're not going to be in bed all day. Later on, that thing you need to know about is now a monster you knew about it in the beginning but you ignored it you ignored it a warning sign a flashing flag was ringing you know what i don't really like the way they do that i don't really like the way they do that now you just said that <laughs> but it's not amen so man uh nancy said, marriage is 24 7 365 no vacation a lifetime sentence with no parole and that's the problem today man see people want to want to break that lifetime sentence because they upset because well she made me mad well i don't believe that i don't, I don't I, i'm getting out of this wait a minute until death do you part and so many people break it so quickly thank you lisa sex doesn't pay the bills and you're not in bed the whole day every day no no that's why that's why people forget that that you all the things in a marriage sex is the last thing that is important because if this is a lifetime covenant lifetime covenant you're setting up you got to have that all fixed before you even worry about the sex part you got to make sure you understand everything about the person you picturing can you live with the person do or do we see things the same way you paying attention to each other's characters are they doing something that makes you mad they, they, they don't even know about it but you need to tell them, you know what there's a little thing that you do that kind of bothers me and sometimes they don't even know it you say it and go you know what i'm sorry you know i, I did that but i did i had no idea that was offensive but they might be doing something jokingly but for you for you it's a perfect it's a little uh i wish you wouldn't do that and and, and, the, and that's amen nancy it's a blood covenant and that's why when i get this is what i get i've listed myself as an officiant to, to weddings right and I, I belong to this directory for people who are looking for for ministers to marry them but they give you their requirements and i can't tell you how many marriages will say i'm looking for a, a wedding officiant uh, but just don't mention God. Wait a minute. You're looking for a pastor or minister to marry you and don't mention God? This is a marriage? Wait a minute. Well, under, under, under God, the two shall become one. What are your vows saying? If you're getting married, a godly covenant, and you're telling me not to mention God. So how can I say God bless your marriage if you just said don't mention God and do the marriage vows? We're talking about God and the two shall become one under God. What? So you do with your marriage as soon as you do the covenant by saying take God out of the out of the vows. But there's a lot of people who do that because because they're trying to remove in their mind godly covenant is not just you and your spouse, a covenant with the Lord. 
and that's what you're working on. And that's what you're trying your best not to break. You just don't jump in the marriage, oh, I'm tired, Let me, I'm leaving, I'm divorced. Jump into somebody else, oh, I'm married, I'm tired. People, you know, for whatever reason, people don't take it serious, and that's the problem there. Okay, the last one, the last one, ironically, <coughs> feeds the second one. We just talked about venomous tongue. Now, the most dangerous tongue, I say this last, the gossiping tongue. Now, the gossiping tongue many times can be venomous. A lot of times, the gossiping tongue starts innocently. Now, what, when, does, when does news about something turn to gossip? See, if something happened today, let's, let's, say, let's say there was a fight at work today. And it's news. Oh, you know what? Man, there was a fight today between blah, blah, blah and blah, blah. Now, that's what happened today. That's news. When you're sharing information about what just happened, that's news. You're not gossiping. A fight happened today at work between such and such a person and such another person because she called her ugly. That's what they fought about. That was, that was the fight. Now, you start talking about what happened today at work, and you once you said the news, you're done. But now, now, okay, guys, we move to the next topic. New, the new topic now. New topic, Carl. Okay. Now, now we're talking about now. Once you, what, once you said the fact of what the information is about, and you you said there was a fight today because the other girl called this other girl ugly. That was the news. End of subject. But then you go a step further. Well, you know what? I don't like her either because she does this, she does that, and I think, matter of fact, you know what? I think she's this and she's that. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's not news. You just now interjected what you think about somebody on top of the news. The fact is, there was a fight today, one girl called the other girl ugly. Period, end of news. Once you start saying, well, I think, and you know, well, let me tell you what I think. Now, wait a minute, what you think, and now turn to gossip. And what you think, it can be venomous, it can be supportive, but it's your opinion about the news and where that goes now turns to gossip. Because once you tell one person, it turns into the telephone game because each person is going to tell your gossip a little bit different and by the time it gets to the fifth person it's nowhere near you know that girl you know they had a fight today and she snapped that girl through over the table and she called her ugly well you know what i think she's ugly you know what and then you throw your each person who gossips adds their own opinion on top of what they heard but remember the first person that gossiped already added a mistruth an opinion the second person hears it they add their opinion on top of another opinion. That's two opinions. The third person, three opinions. Fourth person, it's, it, 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 that's why I call it the telephone game. The telephone game, for those who don't know it, if I whisper into your ear a phrase and you say it to the next person, and the game is going through about 10 people, how different does the, does the phrase change from the first person, the original statement, by the time it gets to the 20th person, it usually is nowhere near what the first person said because every time somebody hears gossip they've got to add their own flavor to the gossip and the gossip gets worse and worse and worse and ends up being totally venomous sometimes and that's why that's why you've got to always make sure that that when you hear somebody coming up to you about something happening at work hey hey lucy when somebody comes to you and they're talking about something that happened whether it's work whatever and if something happened and you, all your response should be, you know what, you know, that, that, that's really bad. You know what, we need to really work on people's uh, disposition. You know, we, we, need, we really need to just kind of kind of just stay calm at work. And that's it. You just comment on the, on the gossip that, that, you know, maybe we have more security. Maybe we, you, your comment should be related to a solution, not add to how you feel or disagree about the news. And that's where it turns into debates and gossip. Now, the poem... It's called the big tongue. Why do people like to run their mouth when they really don't know the deal? They love to say everything they know when they really don't know what's real. Try to see who's talking to who. Is there a relationship in the mix? The gossiping tongue that goes on and on soon finds themselves in a fix. Don't, tear the, don't dare tell them they're way off course as they run their mouth each day. The less they know, it really shows. Now they're the latest news out today. Some people gossip with venomous intent, knowing everything they say will hurt. 
They have no conscience. Their mouth goes on, spewing out all kinds of dirt. Lord, touch these folks who gossip so much, whose words cause so much pain. Teach them how the words they speak will come back on them time again. Gossiping tongue. So don't think that when you speak, when, when you're gossiping on somebody, uh, that that's get warm in the burden. When you're gossiping about somebody, don't think they will turn that gossip back on you. See, when you, and that's the, that's the reap what you sow point of gossip. If you're gossiping to a gossiper about somebody else, it's a pretty good sign that if you ever do something, that same person is going to be gossiping about you. And then you hear what they said about you, you're not going to like it. Because, well, how come you said it about me? Because they're a gossiper. Gossip people, that's what they do. They don't tell the truth. They tell the truth with their inflection on top of it. The truth is always going to be the truth. But once you add your opinion to the truth, it now turns to gossip. And now the more is told, the bigger it gets, it changes and becomes something else, more venomous, more hurtful. And by the time the person who's being gossiped about hears it, they go, well, why are they saying that about me? That's not what happened. Why? That's not what happened, but what happened? This is what happened. How did it get to that? Because gossip took over. And, and the, the, the scripture that's based on, the gossiping tongue is based on uh, Isaiah 58, 11. And I, I love the one. And also, oh, this is the, the one I really like. Uh, James 1, uh, let's see, where is it? Oh, wait, go back. James 1, 26. See, this is, we're talking about just general gossip. But this is gossip if a uh, James 1, 26, I like too. James 1, 26. This is about Christians who gossip. Because Christians should not be gossiping. But do Christians gossip? Thank you, Jesus. Yes, they do. <laughs> James 1, 26. Where is it? 1, 26. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Verse 27, pure and undefiled religion is in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep one another unsustained by the world. Verse 26 is the main one. If you're a Christian and you start cursing somebody out, like I said this before, when we were talking about lukewarm Christians, if you're people you say you're Christian or people are believing you to be a Christian, they're expecting your behavior to be a certain thing. But if you start talking like you're in the world, you're defiling who you are. Because you've just said, I'm a Christian and I'm a man of God, I'm blah, blah, blah. And then people hear you go off and you just curse somebody out like a sailor. And, and then you go back and the next thing they'll say is, I, I thought he was a man of God. Because you just said you're Christian. And the, even the world who may not want to be Christian, they know what a Christian behavior should be. Because the first thing they say when you don't act like a Christian, I thought he was a Christian. That means the word Christian has a reputation before you even say it. If you say you're a Christian, the world is expecting a certain behavior from you. We talk about God is love. If you're cursing somebody out, is that love? If you're speaking venom, is that love? If you're saying something to hurt somebody, to make them break down in tears, is that love? That's not love. That's what, if God is love and we're a Christian, they should see love coming out of us. If they see hurt, profanity, and that's why, that's why it says in Ephesians, I'm getting ready to close, Ephesians uh, 5. We were talking about this the other day. Ephesians 5, uh, but it got to the point of, Let's see, uh, what verse was that? I was talking about that just the other day. Uh, but, uh, oh, okay. L l look at verse 4. Ephesians 5, verse 4. No, let's, let's start at verse 3. But immorality or impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is prosper as proper among the saints. Verse 4. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk, no coarse jesting, which are not fitting but rather giving thanks. Verse 5, For this you know with certainty that no immoral, impure person, covetous person, idolater, 
has an inheritance in the kingdom of God. So impure speech, impure thoughts, impure behavior is not is is listed among things that can cost your salvation. So that's why when we're walking walking the walk of Christians, we've got to continue no matter what. Like they always say, turn the other cheek. If somebody's slapping you, uh, uh, do Bruce Lee on it. Yeah, no, 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 no. When somebody upsets you, <laughs> when somebody upsets you, you you know you don't re respond in a reflex. The main thing we need to remember is not right for them. If somebody comes up to you and they insult you, they speak venom right in your face. Now, yeah, your reflex was to knock them out because they just hit you to the core with something that hurt you. You might have to take a deep breath first of all back up a step because <laughs> if you're too close to him you might take your robe off <laughs> Ooh, i'm sorry <laughs> i got the robe image in my head no loose loose lips sink ships no that's the rule if somebody is too close to you if they're in your space and that's defined scientifically if somebody is closer than three feet to you that three feet circle around you is considered the intimate circle where somebody who knows you really well can get close to you. They stand close to you. If somebody, if somebody is talking mess and they're inside your three foot intimate circle, they're violating your intimacy. And that's usually where somebody's going to swing or do something physically and a fight or confrontation is going to start. That's why when you see fighters get ready to fight, What's the first thing they do? They get nose to nose. They step into each other's circle. They're violating each other's intimacy zone. And then a fight starts out because they've both been violating each other's privacy. So when somebody gets close to you talking mess, step back. Because you stepping back, and look, I'm, I, look, step back, you too, you're too close. Back up, we can talk, but you're too close. Because if you get any closer, I'm right here. <laughs> I take my robe off. <laughs> No, no. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I got, I got, I got my, my friend's name is Mac. Hey, Mac, you got the image in my head now. No, see, see, that's that's what we're always trying to do. See, these are things we got to do in the flesh. Remember, we talked about the flesh and the spirit are always in battle. The flesh always wants to fight. The spirit's trying to be what? Meditate on these things: peace, love, harmony. That's what the spirit's doing. The flesh is ready to fight. So if we have an inner battle within ourselves that we've got to keep control, when somebody's talking mess, they got to be at a distance. They cannot be in your face talking venom. And you, you've got to protect your, your salvation by backing up. If they don't know to back up, you back up. The key is to not let someone talking anger or argument or whatever. That's right. Get back, Jack. Stop. <laughs> Liz, Lisa, you try to get me laughing again. Get back, get back, Jack. Stop, stop talking smack. Talking smack means stop talking mess in my face because you're starting to upset me. Amen. So that's the lessons for today. I, 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 I had we had a good time sharing that because we all know, we all know this this dilemma of when somebody gets in your face in the world, and that all that really is, that's the devil. What, trying to steal your joy. He may be in the other person or talking through the other person, trying to take you out of your robe, so to speak, and bring you back to the world. See, that's what it's all about. Remember, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. None of this is about the flesh. It's about the devil trying to pull you out of your joy and your peace. No matter what confrontation, it's all about the spiritual warfare. That's what's at the bottom of all of it. You can't understand why the two of them are fighting because the devil does not like peace and uh, peace and tranquility among us. The more fights and discord and wars and hatred he can put, he loves, that's all he wants to do is create all the things that are not of God. Hatred, violence, perversion, seduction, lust, all that stuff trying to pull us out of God's will and God's way. And that's why we're in the world. We got to deal with this stress. We got to deal with this mess, but we're not of the world. We're not going to become a part of it. We're going to step back when we have to step back. We're going to stop listening to people who start talking venom. Talk to the hand because my ears are now closed. See, we can, we, you know you can do that. 
when somebody's talking and you're in a room and they just curse you like a sailor. I don't know if you've ever been like this. You ever been in a room where somebody comes in and they're cursing so bad that it feels like you're being hit in the side of the head. Now you are being hit in the side of the head in the spirit because you're in your nice spiritual zone. Somebody comes in totally in the world speaking vulgarity for a long time. You have to close your ears because you're trying to protect your spirit. Because if that gets into your spirit, it disturbs your peace. And you're trying to just enjoy your day. And you got this person over here speaking venom and cursing and all you say, oh Lord, protect close my ear gate, Lord. Close my ear, ear gate. Protect my peace. And so uh, uh ADS, uh, if someone calls across you now, you just <laughs> you throw your anointing oil on them. <laughs> I call you in Jesus' name. Dear God. <laughs> Woo. Oh, their heads start spinning. They start spitting out pea soup in the, in the workplace. <laughs> Stop laughing. Stop laughing. Woo. Oh, God. Help me somebody. Help me somebody. <laughs> oh, die. Die. See, you die. Die. And, and Lisa, been trying to get me laughing. All, all fellowship. But that's a funny visual. Somebody starts speaking venom at you at work. You pull out the Holy Ghost oil. And you start. <laughs> now you made it. Now, 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 a fight breaks out because now you messed up the suit because they got blessing oil on the suit. <laughs> now they're fighting about the suit, not what the fight was originally about. Now you messed up the suit because you poured blessing oil on their clothes. <laughs> Ooh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, yeah. laughter is good for the soul, y'all. We gotta, we gotta have a good time with some of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> we got to have a good time <clears throat> because this world, this world, <laughs> that's right, the end. H, human resources and security. She threw plastic all on me. She messed up my suit. But what are you doing? Oh, and then it breaks down. You got to break it down. Then they fire you for carrying a weapon. Blessing all. Carrying, carrying. <laughs> what was the weapon? She had blessing all, sir. Blessing all? Are you serious? <laughs> Yeah. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that accident report? That that, uh, that uh, when you, every security has a write up in the event. What caused this fight? Well, apparently she threw some uh, some kind of oil on her clothes. Uh, and, then they get, and it gets even funnier trying to explain oil. And then you got to explain what the oil is. And then somebody who doesn't know the word is even funnier trying to explain what blessing oil is. They don't even know what it is. So then you're know, hearing that explanation becomes an, another whole joke. <laughs> Woo, thank you, Jesus, for the joy of the Lord. That's what it's all about. We sharing godly principles, but sometimes this world gets so funny. Hey, Regina, sometimes this world, 5 o'clock news, that's right, this world gets funny in a sense of how you want to react and what's the godly way to react. That's what we're always dealing with, how you want to react and how we must react as children of God. That's the battle we deal with every day. The flesh wants to react one way, the Spirit tells us how we must behave if we're children of God. That's the battle with ourselves. See, the battle is going constantly outside, outside of us and inside of us with what we want to say and what by what we must say as children of God. Because staying in the will and uh, staying there will help that. We've got to allow each one of us, Lord, in this fellowship, Lord, within the sound of my voice, live or archive. Bless every fellowship member right now in the name of Jesus, Lord be able to truly be used to the maximum as you want to use each one of us, Lord, that we may truly be the mighty warriors for Christ that you want us to be, Lord. And as we go our separate ways, Lord, I want to bind every spirit of retribution, revenge, retaliation against any fellowship member because of their participation in this fellowship. And I bind the spirits of retribution, revenge, retaliation, backlash, and I cast all of you demonic spirits and they unnamed and named out of our presence, out of our homes, back to the pit of hell from which you came in the name of Jesus, Lord. And Father God, loose, Lord. Loose into the lives of all the fellowship members. Loose, Lord, unspeakable. Peace, understanding, Lord. Oh, yes, peace. Restoration, Lord. Restore, Lord. Restore all areas of our lives, Lord. Bring healing, restoration. Oh, we take back everything the devil has stolen, Lord. We claim our peace, our peace, Lord. Oh, yes, the peace. Peace beyond understanding. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Restore, restore our zest for life. Oh, our health and well-being, Lord. 
Oh, yes, Lord, we take back right now. We take back, restore every area of our lives in the name of Jesus. Father, God, lose reconciliation. Oh, bless those marriages that are in dispute and discord right now, Lord. Touch every marriage struggling, every family struggling, Lord. Let the anointing and the blood of Jesus cover all those marriages and families that need healing. And Father God, continue to cover the blood of Jesus, all the families and marriages that are not, not in the score are still under attack with the Lord. Give a hedge of protection over them 24-7 to be able to fulfill and continue the godly covenant forth in marriage, Lord. And Father God, loose, loose, Lord, supernatural healing, healing, Lord, to every fellowship member who's dealing with any kind of infirmity, sickness or disease, pain and suffering in their bodies, Lord. By your stripes, we were healed. In the name of Jesus, we claim our healing every single day. We receive our healing in the name of Jesus, Lord. We speak healing every day. We speak life every day. We speak victory every day. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, Lord. And we stand in agreement with that right now in the name of Jesus. The healing, healing is going forth right now. Healing brokenheartedness, Lord. Healing and comforting those who've lost a loved one, Lord. Healing and comfort, Lord. The the dis the brokenhearted, Lord. Oh, Lord, bring, bring healing, Lord, to everybody who has any kind of emotional hurt and pain in their body, in their in their spirit, Lord. And we continue to lift all those who are lost in the backslidden, Lord, to bring them back to the fold, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord, before it's too late. And Father God, lose supernatural overflow, the blessings flowing in and blessings flowing out. We're blessed that we may be a blessing to others. We're the lender and not the borrower. We're above and not beneath. We're out of debt. All of our needs are met. We have plenty more to put in store. We are children of God, and nothing shall by any means hurt us or block our blessings in any way in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise your name, Father God. Father God. Father God. Father God. We thank you in advance for all that we release this day, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Like Lord, hallelujah. Hallelujah. We know our miracles are already on the way, Lord. You know what we prayed for already, Lord. Before we even speak it, you know what we prayed for, Lord. And we thank you right now in advance. We believe we receive that miracle is all on the way. We thank you, Lord. We praise your name for it, Lord. Hallelujah. We give you praise, Lord. We give you praise, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Keep seeing it. Keep seeing that miracle, because the miracle is already on the way. So every time the word miracle comes out of your mouth, you see yourself shouting upon the day of manifestation of that miracle. We thank you, Lord, right now in advance for our miracles, Lord. We thank you in advance for our supernatural healing, our provision, our joy. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.